Boop, boop, ba oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you for stopping by and giving me a few minutes of your time. Happy day, and how are you? Just nerding out on a little code here. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about an effect. I have given a name. I have given a name to something. So, I don't know, maybe somebody else can tell me what this is really called. But I'm calling it the organized room effect. And the more and more and more I've been playing lately, those of you that are following along or not, uh, I'm like the rest of you. I'm just writing code, and these programming languages keep changing, and the patterns, eh, most of them stay the same. And bridging that gap for traditional developers, you know, folks that, I don't know, 15 years ago I would have said, I'm working in the enterprise. 20 years ago I would have said, I'm working in the enterprise. What a joke compared to today. Like every three years, it becomes a terrible joke again. What do you do? <laughs> All right, so this organized room effect. I've created a pretty big mess over here. And as I continue to grow in my development um, journey, <laughs> I'm always having a heart for where I was 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and the people that get stuck along the way. How can we build Benter metal models and how can we kind of rig the game in favor of the engineer and move some amount of that pain off to the CI pipelines and the CD pipelines? And how can even words like that make sense to a, an extreme hobbyist or a junior mid-level developer that maybe has been in the environment of these things but not authored them perhaps from scratch or have that deep intimacy? So if we take a quick look at the, this mess in my evolution, and again, my posture, I spent a lot of time working in agile dojos and trying to help lots of teams from wherever they are to attempt to begin to move towards modernization, uh, tech stack modernization, and technical upskilling. And then, <laughs> for many, we're just stuck in between two worlds. So get you really good at... 2019 and before and then finally we will begin probably a journey towards cloud and cloud native and what it can mean uh, a whole, whole nother paradigm but so both worlds and standing between the gap spend a lot of time in in architectures and systems giant systems that are very old have been bolted onto for many decades and how do we then begin that journey and so the patterns you're about to see are patterns that fit nicely into existing messes as well as helping set up the future now if you don't completely have to bridge both worlds there's a few things here you can shave off but it's it's largely just just clean so the whole world starts with a shared kernel and he's pretty boring just has a shared base entity and shared base tracked entity the idea of some shared base domain events a couple of interfaces for aggregate root and our repository pattern also started to add some extension methods um, and am beginning to tackle the value object stiff. So that's all in kernel. As we leave kernel, we run into these sort of microservice layers where I've taken what you might normally think of as a uh, single database and broke out all of its sort of concerns. So we would see here, uh, it's the idea of a server game, game lobby, players, 10 people showed up, now the game starts, something happens, the game ends, the results are recorded. And so there's a moment there of the actual gameplay that is not the concern of this platform. It's more just a wrapper. If you wanted to build a simple something for folks to interact and wanted to be able to assume a multiplayer environment using SignalR and Blazor and all these other great things, what, what might that look like? All right. So we have servers and players and games and game results and lobbies and accounts, right? These are all friends. But in terms of source of truth, we're going to let them kind of cover over their own entities and concerns. And the only way you'll talk to servers or any of the um, tables or, or <laughs> domain concerns kind of hard, hard to talk about sometimes, but that whole microservice is going to protect itself. One single point of entity, entrance, the domain aggregate root, in this case, server, and server will go on to have probably additional tables to support its persistence, maybe messaging queues and flat file storage, oh my, right? All of those different things that may come into play. Within the server concern, we see the core 
uh, domain object, uh, aggregate root and friends. We see the infrastructure where it can now attach to entity framework and flat file and messaging queues, all the things you would deal with in your infrastructure layer. And then we see the API layer that uses the infrastructure to talk, <laughs> deal with core. And all of these are contained and tests to the same. So your unit tests, your uh, infrastructure uh, feature tests, integration tests. And then we'll come out and we'll look at how to compose the UI back together. And then the UI will have those UI tests. Now, what I'm really finding very interesting in this particular set of um, project architecture patterns and tests and learnings and things I'm playing with. Loving it. It's very clean. And it's allowing me to just naturally feel very, very selfish about <laughs> shellfish, uh, about where I'm at. Hopefully you're not allergic to shellfish. Oh, just play. Because um, I am just the server. I don't, I get to protect just, just be really selfish about my concerns in the whole wide world. And so when I start at the very root of everything, right, this business logic, forgetting databases and flat files and APIs and endpoints, oh my, and just thinking very particularly about the needs and concerns and dangers that exist in the world for this tiny robot called server. And so uh, server has a protected instantiation pattern uh, privately for entity framework there's this uh, overloaded default constructor that most of the world can't get to just to kind of help with with a moment there but you could ignore that and just look at these publicly exposed constructors and we see servers already doing something interesting to protect itself it's saying look if you want to make a new one of me you better show up with a name and attempt domain if you don't do that i'm going to throw some exceptions and move on with my day if you want to overload that, you could also give me an ID. That's okay with me, right? Uh, and then if we look at the public signature that is exposed, we have a public name, getter, and a private setter. So everything that we're going to protect, we have private setters on. So you can't just reach down here and do whatever you want in code later. You have to come in and ask update name, update domain, update temp domain, you know, et cetera. All right. Makes sense. Pretty boring, straightforward. This is the code that most folks were able to write, you know, and, and see day one in CS course 101. <laughs> We've done this. We weren't necessarily allowed to do this out in the wild because we didn't perhaps know how to map it all together, but uh, this feels good. Now that I am just this selfish guy, <laughs> robot, I keep hearing shellfish, and it's funny to me. Um, I can think about my world. So here, I don't even have any substructures right now. I just have this, this server um, aggregate root. But I also then have tests. And when we come in and I just look at the test set up for that aggregate root, I have a constructor, create new, throw errors, update existing. And I was able to spend a few minutes going back and forth between these tests and that initial file, maturing both. But it's definitely back and forth. They mature each other. And as I'm going, I'm, I'm refactoring both sides to the point that they work. And then I'll go and continue to refactor the code side until it's lovely, right? Until it's reasonable to step away from. The point of all this, right? It's just, again, this very quiet in all of this world of which most of this stuff doesn't even build. I've only built this in the last few hours. There's trash everywhere and empty, broken paths and files. All right now, I said, you know what? I'm just going to focus on this first server's microservice, get it in play, work it through the whole stack, and then I'll come back and scoop up these others. Feels, feels like a nice way to do things. I'm going to see the whole thing exercised, probably go all the way to production. I want to see it deployed probably, before I get too deep into solving more problems. So can I initialize it with a name? And we see here one of my favorite uh, little friends is these fluent assertions. And so test server name should be equal to you know, the name we initiate initialized it with coming from this static test data. And so let's look at a few interesting bits before we leave um, just this bottom business layer in our domain. If we come back to server, a couple of things. One, I'm going to shift all of my null checks. And you sh if you're not, 
you know, again, in the, in the effort of being shellfish, um, I don't want to talk to you if you give me a bad name, right? I'm going to protect parameters and protect against bad parameters first thing inside of each method or, or constructor or call, right? And so once I'm happy that those parameters look okay, I can do whatever, but that's always the first thing we do. I've been using these guard against clauses and things, but uh, this morning I just found myself doodling and I wrote an extension method for strings that takes the exception as a generic type argument and can throw of null and white space, right? And I think I might even add in maybe a message or I can think about adding in a pattern to these exceptions for a method. If we look at that extension method, all right, we are, you can really ignore everything down to here. And so having a public static string this allows us to essentially add new behavior to that string that you've known and loved your whole life or anything else, right? At the point of these extension methods without having to open that code or recompile it or have any special access to it. And so here we're teaching string a new behavior. Throw if null or white space, take in a generic type and itself the string. We'll come back to this where clause. We're going to ask ourselves if that string, uh, using, again, string, <laughs> uh, we're going to ask, is this null or white space? If so, we're going to throw, and we're going to ask activator to create an instance of whatever type was. And the only way this works right here is because we are saying uh, where t is of type exception, that way we can throw of type exception exceptions. If we excluded this, then we would end up with object, and then we'd have some conversion problems uh, when we're trying to then create an instance of and throw that exception. And if we look at those, they are pretty boring, you know, just like you'd expect they inherit from exception. And if I want to come up with a pattern for like error message or something a little better, then I can add some sort of an interface and grow this further. Cool. So I liked that, right? And kind of helping clean up and protect you know, those parameters as they come in and get assigned and um, practicing some other patterns. But this is ultimately what I'm going to go with. And so now I can remove these guard against clauses and finish uh, implementing this for objects and things like that. So that was pretty cool. I like that a lot. The next thing that I'm not in love with, I'm continuing to look at different patterns. If you've got a good pattern, please point me to it or share it with me. Uh, but this idea of static test data. And so for now, at the base objects project level, I've started to maintain you know, static test data, right? Pretty boring. I can grab server one and server two and have some amount of predictable stiff and continue to grow that pattern. It's all right. Not my favorite thing in the world. Super handy. Uh, so I don't really have any complaints other than a giant block of static uh, object that's like always <laughs> going to be instantiated and live, uh, live. Um, and then what I think is going to happen, because I just started playing with this pattern, I, I don't have any clue actually what's going to happen, but I want to break it and see. Uh, can I somehow bridge static partial classes across? And to give it a fighting chance, I've, tr I've injected the same namespace in this case, which is kind of weird, and weird moments aren't great. We'll see what happens. But am I able to turn right around at the inter... Uh, infrastructure layer and simply continue to grow that same sense like does this class actually extend uh, as partial this class if it does eh, okay decent pattern keeps it pretty lightweight until I come up with something better so that helps with, with that static test data. So if you noticed over here in the constructors, being able to reference that static test data. I did mention moving everything to Fluent, and so I don't know if I've completed that chore, but these are all using Fluent assertions. So it's just like saying assert, blah, 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 should be null, blah, 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 blah. It's a little bit uh, more readable and uh, brilliant. Now, something a little trickier, these throw errors, right? Uh, not a big deal, pretty easy to deal with. And so if I do try to create a server with an empty name, 
um, and then turn around and around. Write this test a few different ways to make sure it works. Can I throw that named exception? And those are pretty kind. I'm just loving, you know, uh, Uncle Bob. I hear him in the back of my head. Starting to get to that place, especially because of uh, another trick. Make sure you've seen are these. Um, ah, it's not mentioned here. Please hold. These implicit usings. Uh, and these are nullable strings and uh, other uh, super cool. A lot of a lot of updates, but stick with it for a minute. These these global using statements. And uh, so then, when we uh, say Uncle Bob, when we look at these files, uh, let's go back to the actual server file. For the most part, the lines per method and uh, ultimately lines per code just starts to really quiet down, right? We are using this namespace pattern. If you've only got a single namespace for file, you don't need to do the sawtoothing. That's great. And um, and those global usings, you know, for the most part, means no more using statements. So just really delicious uh, how nice things are getting. You can see as I've been moving around, my IDE isn't probably thrilled. The release just came out of... Uh, the latest .NET 6, so I'm not mad at it and familiar enough to just keep cruising. But um, hopefully they get that caught up. That wouldn't be fun. And then we have some tests should should update. So there you go. The organized room in full effect. <laughs> Funny name I'm giving this. This idea of doing a good job early of focusing on project architecture and having some of these patterns. Uh, if you haven't seen them, these silly you know things I'm doing here to prefixing with underscores and pluses and silly things and believe it or not these are part of patterns make it kind of color by number right so everything sorts where you would want it and uh, we're able to force those patterns with minimal impact it's often positive impact to our development experience and the organized room theory in full effect. So I'm not worried about players or games or game results. I can come right down here and I can uh, build the kernel, which is uh, the thing, the only dependency I have. And then I could come up here to the actual server project. Again, its only dependency was on this project. Then we come out here to these tests. And we see that our unit tests run uh, to the same. Just a delightful way to be. And so from here, now that each that this you know service for servers is fairly healthy and up to go and has good tests, uh, it's time to move into the infrastructure and API layers. And so I'm going to go ahead and work on that a little bit, come back and give you an update here in a minute. Let's see what happens as we take this one very, very simple microservice concept, move it through its layers and orthogonal or onion or DDD architectures, expose it you know cleanly as a single kind of holding your hand api has its own database life is good listens on an endpoint got nice tests knows how to build and deploy itself and then we'll come out here to blazer and maybe the console we'll probably chase both maybe a few others you know see what else we can bring in for UI and UI should just be an expression of those other things. So we'll just kind of compose it all together and ask it a handful of questions. And from that, we'll be able to draw on the screen or on the web page or in the you know console or wherever you happen to want to output your UI. A robotic arm going up and down. Those things live way outside the concerns of these. So good. Looking forward to seeing you here in a little bit. I hope there's something in there for you. The organized room. Have your project architecture make good sense for the level of developer and development experience. And, and depending on how large your team is and how old your application, create these really clean ways to start separating what you can out into these services. And they can stay inside your project. They can continue to share one database. They could start to step away by adding some, some namespacing to your database or 
maybe they can step away to have their own database, you know, one day, right? As they journey towards exiting your monolithic application architecture and standing as more of a microservice architecture, still, again, can live and deploy uh, however you want. It could stay very near the code for a while and deploy with the code. It could later venture out to deploy as a standalone microservice uh, with or without its own database. All these choices become an option and it's not all messy and fuzzy and you're not paying a huge price for that flexibility uh, so long as we can get together on these patterns and we can understand where the right places are to begin refactoring our code. Uh, the most common language around this is the strangler pattern, right? Is we have these giant systems, we need to begin migrating some of that code out and freeing up, uh, even as we do, by pulling chunks of code and process and behavior out of your existing monolith, it's going to free up and speed up and feel better, right? As you start to cut these things out, it isn't just about the new systems are going to come online and perform well and give you access to all those futuristic things. Your system has a struggle getting to today because it's tr trapped where it is, but then that older system also becomes less burdened. Ugh. Delicious. See you next time. I hope you're having a great time learning this stuff. Uh, reach out. As always, connect with us on Discord. We like being nerdy. Cheers. Dun, 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 dun.